been given this scarf to wear tonight, and I was sure it was a sure thing. And I'll tell you where it all went wrong. When I heard Randy over there was cheering for Alabama, he jinxed my team. He did that on purpose, by the way. He jinxed my team. Players started going down hurt, and all of a sudden we're losing. So drink it in and enjoy it. <laughs> I'm going to set this nice, lovely scarf right here. I hope it catches on fire on this amp as, as we get into our, into our preaching tonight. <laughs> we better go to prayer now. We better start praying. This, this thing's lost all, all hope from being anything holy and sanctified. We do want to keep um, Ron George in our prayers. Um, uh, he had an episode. I know he's got a last name, Alexander, excuse me, Ron George Alexander. Um, and uh, he had an episode last night, again, with his sugar. And just there's some, there's some things that Carolyn had texted me in that, in that situation that, that um, just keep on giving him problems. So do pray for the Alexanders. Do keep him uh, in your prayers. Um, it, is, it is good to see Linda tonight. As you know, she had the, um, she had the injection. So uh, we just want to continue to remember her in our prayers and just, and just continue to pray uh, for her to feel better. And um, just want to keep everybody on this prayer list uh, in our prayers and to pray for them. And at this time, if you have a prayer request or if you have a praise, please raise your hand and one of the microphones will come to you and we want to hear your request and we want to bear your burden or, or enjoy your praise with you. I'll pray for uh, Emily tonight. She's... Uh got a little touch of uh, pneumonia and she's in, they, uh, mm. she's in the hospital they're kind of watching her oxygen you know she's expecting so they work they're doing that because of the baby and also continue to remember diane's dad he's still in the hospital mm. most definitely anybody else prayer request praise something you want to mention tonight donna i believe has one there mm -hmm. For Haley Carr, that's Alice's daughter, her fiance, they found him uh, dead. And so just remember that family. Okay. Um, we're going to go to Marcy in just a second, but I actually have a praise as well. And I know many of you have probably, um, you've probably already seen it, but the little, the, the teenage girl that, um, that had gone missing or had ran away, she, she's been found. And, and so that's a great that's a great praise and great blessing that she wasn't harmed and that she's, she was found. Marcy, you can go ahead. Please keep in mind, uh, a week from today, Sandra has a six-month CAT scan. And just keep her in your prayers that everything goes well. All right. Anybody else? Prayer request? Praise tonight? Terry has one. Unspoken. If you have an unspoken, please lift your hand tonight. So we can all right. Anybody else have something they want to mention? Oscar, will you lead us in a word of prayer tonight, please? Amen. I want you to take your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Tonight our devotion, our time in the Word, comes from verse 18 through verse 30. And I want to play off of what Oscar said in his prayer about bringing honor and glory to him. Um, I had not uh, planned on calling on Oscar for prayer. The Lord just brought it into my mind as we were getting ready to pray. And I always find that so interesting that as the Lord leads you and then they say something in their prayer, they say something that really triggers what, what the Lord has put on your heart to talk about as well. I just, I just love the way that God moves and the way that God does things. Tonight we're, we're going to look at uh, the glory that belongs to God. Because our biggest passion and our biggest purpose in everything we do 
ought to be to bring glory to God. When we think about coming to worship, when we think about the church, when we think about any kind of result, the first result we ought to be thinking about and purposing in our heart ought to be, does this bring glory to God? Is God glorified? And that ought to be where we want to go. And as we get into this passage tonight, um, I just want to mention kind of what has come to my heart this week as I've been studying this passage. I think about the Puritans, and I think about how they were such a fierce group for the Scriptures, for holiness, for the glory of God, that they were known to sew Scripture passages on their clothes. They were known to write Scripture passages above uh, their mirrors. They were known all through their house. They would have the scriptures. They would have the word of God there because they wanted to be saturated with the word of God. There was nothing in their lives that meant more to them than exalting Jesus, honoring God, bringing glory to his name, and they wanted to surround themselves with the word of the Lord. And Something you need to know about the Puritans is they suffered greatly. Their lives were not easy. Their life was full of sufferings and full of hardships. And through it all, they could live their lives in such a way because all they cared about was the glory of God. In this passage tonight, we're going to see how God takes us from the groanings from the sufferings, from the hardships, to the praises when our purpose is to bring God glory and nothing else. I want you to join me in Romans 8 as we look at verse 18 through 30. Keep in mind the context is that the Apostle Paul has been expounding here on salvation by faith alone and grace alone in Christ alone, and how the glory that we will receive ultimately can't be compared with the sufferings that we face in this life. So look with me at verse 18 to verse 30. There's so much in this this passage. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits. We also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope For what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Note this. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. Because we do not know what to pray, as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groaning. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, 
he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. When we look at a mountain of Scripture like this, When we look at a passage this heavy, this deep, full of application, we must consider it as Paul breaks down his case. He has been speaking within Romans to a people that needed to hear and needed to understand the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had an advantage. He is talking to Jews. And the advantage is that he has been a Jew his whole life. The advantage is that he was a Pharisee among Pharisees from the tribe of Benjamin. The advantage is that as he writes this letter, he can anticipate when the gospel comes how a Jew would raise a question about the gospel. As Paul is writing this letter, to his kinsmen, as he is writing this letter to the Jews, he knows where they would object and he knows what the objection would be because he's been a Jew, he's been a Pharisee of Pharisees, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, he knows what he would have objected to and he knows what the common Jew would have objected to. We can't really even get our arms around how in love Paul was with his own kinsmen. And I say that because Paul makes a statement within the book of Romans that goes like this. If it were possible for me to be accursed, let me put it into the vernacular, if it was possible for me to go to hell, And if me going to hell meant that every Jew got to go to heaven, then I would count it a joy to be accursed, to go to hell, if that meant my kinsmen got to go to heaven. Paul was writing this letter with so much passion for the Jews to hear the true gospel and to be saved. Folks, As we pray tonight, we need to pray for that kind of passion for our own community. We need to pray that our heart breaks for liberty, that our heart breaks for Pickens County, that our heart breaks for this community and this area because we tend to think because we're in the Bible Belt and there's so many churches around that you have to go to the big city or a foreign country to find the lost that are going to bust hell wide open. But the fact of the matter is they're right here in Pickens County. They're right here in Liberty. They're right here among us. We need our hearts broken for the gospel Broken so much that we'll do whatever it takes to get out of the walls of this church and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that means we have to get really uncomfortable and get our feet dirty and get our hands dirty, then we'll do that because of our love for our own kinsmen. As Paul loved the Jew, as Paul loved his own kinsmen. Now, I want to take you to verse 18 where we started. Look at what Paul says. Keep in mind that you are justified not by your works, not by who you are, not by who your parents are, not by living here in this county, but you are justified by what Christ has done for you. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Now listen to me very carefully. To live is to suffer. And the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, the more godly you are, the more gospel-centered and gospel-oriented you are, 
The more you share Jesus with people, the more you love people, the more you are for the gospel, the more persecution you can expect, the more suffering that's going to come. Now, as I look upon this congregation tonight, I'm not going to even try to pretend to understand what personally you might be going through that's not public knowledge. You haven't called me. You haven't texted me. You haven't asked to meet with me. You haven't told me what you're suffering with. I don't know what that is. But I do want to tell you this. As you suffer, as I suffer, as we suffer as people, as we face hardships, as we face hard times, understand whatever suffering that is, it can't even begin to be compared to the glory that has yet to be revealed. Whatever suffering, whatever hardship, whatever case, whatever you're facing Tonight, whatever you're facing presently, it's not going to last forever. It's not going to go on forever. Because there's going to come a day where the glory of God is revealed. And it's going to be so much sweeter, so much more powerful than if you took the suffering and you turned the suffering up as loud as it can possibly be, the loud suffering that we face in our darkness can't even begin to be compared with the glory that is going to be revealed. The, the creation groans for this glory. You groan for this glory. The trauma that we face, the problems that we face, the betrayals that we face, the sufferings that we face, all that we face can't even begin to compare to God's glory. And we come to a place spiritually in our walk with Christ where sufferings become a part of life Hardships, dear friend, become a part of life. And it's through those sufferings, and it's through those groanings, and it's through those hardships that we learn to depend on God even more. You know, I've known people throughout my Christian walk that faced some pretty horrendous things. But you know, in their personality, they were able to be some of those pleasant people I've ever been around. They were able to put a smile on. They were able to be kind, and they were able to be nice, even though they have gone through some of the hardest things a person could possibly go through. You ever wondered, how does a person do that? I knew a lady one time in a church context took her daughter to an alligator adventure. Somehow her daughter made her way through the fence and got down where the alligators were. And her daughter, or she had to watch her daughter be eaten alive by alligators. There was nothing she could do. There was nothing anybody else could do. That lady had the sweetest spirit and the sweetest smile for as long as I knew her. How do you get up and how do you face life under that suffering? Think about the one that penned this. Think about Paul. Nobody besides Christ suffered like Paul suffered. In Galatians, he says, am I, am I after pleasing men? Am I trying to please people? Am I to really care what the people think of me? Well, if I were, then I'd be living my life a lot differently if I really cared about all that. No, I care about God getting the glory. And I care about the glory going to God, and I care about glorifying God. This was the same man in 2 Corinthians who gives a list longer than a child's Christmas list of the persecutions, the sufferings, the attempts of murder that were on Paul's life for doing what? For preaching the gospel, 
Because this man had one ambition, to bring glory to God. Now, all of this suffering you face, all of the trial, all of the uncertainty, all of the worry that we can muster up, all of facing the unknown, and we know what that's like, don't we, church? Because every church in America has faced the unknown of who they're going to be, what their identity is, how they're going to move forward in, if we can ever get to what we can call a post-pandemic, a post-COVID age. It's the fear of uncertainty. So you know what happens in times of stress, in times of hardship, in times of uncertainty? We can get to such a place, we don't even know how to pray. We don't even know what we're supposed to pray. We don't even know what to ask God for. We don't even know how to ask God for what we don't know what to say. This is what Paul's getting at. Look at verse 26. Look at what happens. This is so remarkable. Look at what happens here. In the same way, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God helps us with our weakness. Listen, when you are weak, he is strong. And I would rather be weak and depend on his strength than try to be strong and live void of his strength. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? When we are weak, in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should. Now, we think we know what to pray. We attempt to pray. We try to pray in these kind of times. But Paul makes it clear. You don't know, I don't know what to pray as we should. But, aren't you glad about the but? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. Listen, God, the Spirit, is groaning on your behalf to God the Father. (laughs) The Holy Spirit is taking all of your suffering. He's taking all of your anguish. He's taking all of your hurt. He's taking all that you suffer from and suffer with and face. And he is crying out a groan for you. Let me see if I can illustrate this tonight. How many parents, just raise your hand tonight if you're a parent tonight. I don't care how old your child is. Your child, let's say, is suffering with something heavy. Suffering with something that's really got him or her defeated. It's bad, folks. It's really bad. They don't know what to do. They don't know how they're going to go forward in life. As far as they're concerned, life is over. And as they are crying, and as they feel helpless, and as they are hurting, here you are, the parent, mom, dad. And you wrap your arms around that child. I don't care how old they are. You wrap your arms around that child, and you cry with them. You weep with them. Your tears are tears of agony for them because you can sense their pain. You've heard their story. You are hurting for them. You are groaning, groaning for your child who you love more than you ever thought or knew you could love anything. And God, God the Spirit, is doing the same thing in your life, friend. He is groaning. He is groaning, these groanings of anguish, these groanings of sadness, these groanings of your suffering and your hurt on your behalf to God the Father. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a wonderful, remarkable truth? Even when we feel we have nobody and we're in this alone, and nobody cares, God does. The Spirit of the living God is 
is suffering with you, groaning with you, and he's groaning, groanings to God the Father on your behalf. He is interceding for you. (laughs) You can just get lost in that, can't you? Look at verse 27. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He searches our hearts. He truly knows us. He knows our most intimate thoughts. He knows our darkest thoughts we don't want anybody else to know. He knows how we feel. He searches our heart. He groans for us. He prays for us with inexpressible groanings. And he does all that he does in your life according to the will of God. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter, another helper to help you. The Holy Spirit of God is in your life if you're a believer tonight. And he doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you no matter how hard and difficult the road gets. He is here to groan with you, to cry with you, to mourn with you. He goes on your behalf and he prays to God the Father on your behalf. Now, I think it's an amazing, awesome gift of God when another brother comes alongside me and wants to pray for me. I love that uh, Sunday mornings before we have service, Myself and the, the deacon body gather in my office and we, we have prayer for the service. We pray for the service to be Christ-centered. We pray that God would take over. We pray that, that he would be glorified. That's a special time for a pastor to, to experience that and to have those men sometimes weeping as they pray. But, dear friends, one thing to have a brother And that's awesome, that's great, that's wonderful. But the Holy Spirit of God, God himself, who knows you better than anyone can, who knows every hair that's numbered on your head, he is praying for you. He is interceding on your behalf. And isn't it amazing how Paul just goes in order? It's very organized here because in verse 28, in reference to God's will, look at what he says. Look at what he says here. This has really tripped many up and confused people, but it doesn't have to be that way. We know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Listen, you're suffering, you're hurting. You don't know how you're going to face tomorrow. The Spirit intercedes for you and groans for you. And listen, listen. Verse 28 again. Listen. We know. We know this. We know that all things, everything works together for the good. To those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. We see something and we say, bad. We say, I'm suffering over here. I'm drowning over here. I'm dying over here. Things can't possibly get any worse. God says, listen, all things, all things work together for the good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to God's purpose. Romans chapter 8 helps us to understand and live and own our own suffering. We don't have to be defeated by suffering. That's what Satan wants. That's what the old devil is after. 
He can't take your salvation from you, but he can make you feel worthless. He can make you feel small. He can lie to you just like he lied in the garden. He can continually make you useless if you let him. Or you can render all your sufferings as lessons and how, man, things are bad right now. But I I don't know how it's going to happen. But God is going to work through this in a miracle I just know. (laughs) I just know that God's going to take this mess that's before me and this mess that I'm in, and he's going to make a masterpiece out of it because that's what he does. Bob Ross says, I'm going to put a little bit of sunshine right here. I'm going to put some trees here. I'm going to put some mountains here. I'm going to do this over here. God said, I already made those trees. I already made those mountains. I already made that sunshine. I'm for you. Who in the world can be against you? Bob Ross and his afro is great, but God is greater. (laughs) He's the true maker, the true masterpiece. When you look at verse 29, look at what he says. For those he foreknew, he also predestined, oh, there's that bad word we don't want to mention, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This passage has given us trouble because we get stuck on the predestination term. But folks, listen, we got to deal with it. It's in the text. It's in the Bible. Predestination over and over and over again. You can run from it, but here it is over and over again in the text. So how are we going to deal with it? How are we going to handle it? How are we possibly going to stomach such a word like predestination? Because all of us tend to think because this word is there, that means that God did any, meeny, miny, mo, and he chose the people he wanted to save, and he damned the people he didn't care about saving. But that's not the real doctrine of predestination. And that's not what's happening here. Now understand, Paul is talking to those who've been saved. He's talking to the justified. He's talking to the ones that have heard the gospel, right? And so in this doctrine of justification, the question you want to ask is predestined to what? Predestined for what? Look at it again, verse 29. For those he foreknew, he also predestined. Predestined to salvation. We'll read it again. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. It's that when you get saved, what you're predestined to is to be like Jesus. That's what he's saying. He's saying you're conforming to the image of Christ. What does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, we must be salt and light. We must not hide our light under a basket, but we must be replicas of him in this world. We must conform to the image of Christ. Look at uh, at verse 30. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, I don't know if you've picked up on this yet. I don't know if you've noticed this yet. And this is, this is why we want to point things out like this, because as you read the Bible, I want you to start picking up on this as you read through whatever text you're going to read. You wake up in the morning, you've got your devotional book, you've got your open windows, you've got whatever you're using, and you're going to the Word of God. I want you to see this. Now, in verse 30, hopefully, you picked up on repetition. You picked up on he several times, right? Verse 30, and those he predestined, 
he also called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Josh, why are you making such a big deal out of repetition? Why should we care about that? Why should we really be consumed with wanting to know how many times something like he is repeated? Let me tell you why. Because the thing that people never talk about when they talk about predestination is this truth that has been brought out by all the he's that's mentioned in verse 30. As long as it's he that's doing it, there's not a human work involved in salvation. Salvation is the work of God from beginning to end. Salvation is God's plan. Salvation is God's purpose. Salvation is God's goal. Salvation is what God has done. Jesus is who God has sent, and he has come for you, and he has come that you would be saved, and it's all about God. It's not about us. not about you. Oh, but I just got to do this, and I just got to do that, and I just got to live this way, and I just got to live that way. Listen, when you get saved, you stop saying, I got to, and you just start doing it. It's not, I have to do this. This is a chore. This is a, I have to live this way. I have to remind myself not to do all these crazy immoral things. You don't want to do those things anymore. You don't want to be involved in that anymore. Oh, you, you Christians, I tell you, you really are lame. I mean, you can't even go to the bar and get drunk anymore. I don't want to do that. <laughs> you, y'all are a bunch of squares. You can't sit around and do drugs. I don't want to do drugs. You know? I don't want to commit immorality. I want to know Jesus, and I want to make him known. And I want to live for him, not because I have to, but because I want to, because I love Jesus. And when you love Jesus, that's what you want to do. You don't have to wake up one day or any day and say, I wonder if I'm going to cheat on my spouse today. No, no. I love my spouse. I want to honor and serve my spouse. I don't want to go and do that. The same thing's true. For us in our Christian life, once we've been saved and God's gotten a hold of us, we want to serve him and live for him with all we have. So, we pray now. We spend time in prayer. But I want to challenge you tonight. I want to challenge you. Don't pray tonight for some kind of result to happen. It sounds odd, doesn't it, from your pastor? Don't pray tonight that more visitors would just come Sunday. (laughs) Don't pray tonight that programs would take off. Don't pray tonight that for once the preaching will be good, just once. (laughs) Don't pray tonight for those things. Kind of like salvation, pray for one thing that's going to take all that to the next level. Glory be to God. Pray that our attention as a church would be so magnified on Jesus, so focused on the God of heaven, so spirit-filled that all we would be focused and concerned about is that glory would be given to him. And I want to guarantee you something. The church that shifts their focus to the glory of God and doing everything for his glory, you're going to see all of the above come. But if we focus only on results that we want to see, you're going to see drowning. And you're going to see nothing happen. Let us focus on God's glory and glorifying him. We're going to go into our time of prayer now.